I got a really good response yesterday on my kind of funny Charlotte Corday decapitation story. And I thought, why can't we just do a history talk on Charlotte? Charlotte, the angel of assassination. It's a pretty badass nickname. Hang on, my coffee's done. Steamy. History talk is free and a hobby, but you do have the option to buy me a coffee now. I have a buy me a coffee account in my uh, bio. Obviously no obligation, but you'll be help supporting the real brains of the operation, Mr. Joe here. And today it's fall spice, Starbucks. Mm. So let's talk Charlotte. She looks sweet and lovely. She may have been, I, I don't know her. But this sweet, unassuming looking young woman stabbed a revolutionary leader to death in his bathtub. Charlotte was a royalist sympathizer, but not in the way that, say, somebody who was actually a higher-up member of the aristocracy would have been during the French Revolution. She was noble, but her family had been impoverished for a while. And as things became progressively more violent, she stepped in to end it herself. Before we dive into Marat and the events of the French Revolution, let's meet Charlotte. She was born in 1768 in Cannes. I think I'm saying that correctly. Not like Cannes Film Festival, but Cannes in the northwest of France. Normandy. Charlotte's mother and sister died when she was very young, and her father sent her to be educated at an abbey, which was, you know, pretty normal for the time. Her family wasn't wealthy wealthy, but they were aristocrats. As for her physical description, she was 5'1", wait, I'm like 5 feet, gray eyes, and brown hair. So, just picture me, but like with a better hat. Same height and everything. She's growing up as the revolution is raging in France. Please go back and watch my series on that, because it's really hard to describe all that in... 10 seconds or less. But this was the part of the revolution where things were starting to get radicalized and not for the better. Because while everybody agreed that they wanted to overthrow the monarchy, some of them wanted to do it by spilling a lot of blood and causing chaos and terror. And Marat was one of those. This is a good time to go back and watch my French Revolution series so you have an idea of the basic setup of the government at this time. Three estates. First estate, clergy. Second estate, royalty third estate, everybody else. And even though they all wanted to overthrow the monarchy, some of them just wanted to annihilate everybody. And that is this, where well, he's back, he's back. Maximilian Robus frickin' Pierre. Ain't this motherfucker more than Satan him fucking self? He was part of the Jacobins and he just wanted to watch the world burn. He was that guy. In this, national convention that had been formed, this new form of government. You had the Jacobins, which were more hardcore. The Montagnards, which were kind of on their side. And this small French group of kind of the more moderate group called the Girondins. Charlotte Corday kind of politically aligned herself with the Girondins, but they were about to get steamrolled. I promise we'll get to Marat in just a second. The infighting was making it very difficult for the French government to form after the revolution. Robespierre started as a Montagnard, because they were part of the Jacobins, technically. But then all of a sudden they started executing Montagnards and uh, Girondins. This is why the American Revolution is kind of special, and I'm not saying that as an American. I'm saying that because most revolutions like this, the French and the Russian, end up falling apart because of infighting. Who's going to lead? They had no plan. The Girondins weren't really a political party, but rather a group associated with the Jacobins that were a little more moderate, a little more chill. One famous uh, Girondin is Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense, and the Rolands. Charlotte was definitely a Girondin sympathizer, and her ideology got stoked mainly when they decided to execute Madame Roland, and Madame Roland's husband died by suicide to avoid being executed publicly. So Charlotte decided to do something about it. Let's meet Marat. Jean-Paul Marat was one of those journalist, enlightened thinkers, writers, yada, 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 of this time period. He was a radical, and I won't even say that as a bad thing. He was outspoken in support of the sans culottes, which in French literally means without britches. That doesn't literally mean that people were running uh, around France with no pants on. There's a veil in France where the people wear... No. It was just used to refer to the people who couldn't afford those fancy pants trousers. It was a negative term, and then Marat kind of boosted it as, yeah, we don't have those pants. We're not fancy like you guys. So, not a bad start. He kind of devoted himself entirely to politics in the last part of his life. But at one point, he was working for the king as an advisor. But then he turned around and really recommended that the king be decapitated because we don't need no king. He believed that the Girondins were the enemy of the Republic. One thing you need to know about Marat, he had a terrible skin condition that left him in a bathtub frequently. 
So now let's talk a little bit about why Marat hated the Girondins. In 1793, both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were decapitated. And from that point on, he just focused his attention on the Girondins. And once you figure out you can use violence to take out one group of people, you can use it on another people if you don't like them. The Girondins demanded that this man be tried by tribunal for his crimes. Marat was imprisoned and then acquitted. He even told people that he had no bad intentions towards the assembly and the convention, which was a bunch of horse <laughs> So Marat was free to be a jerk to the Girondins, and Charlotte Corday herself had sort of become radicalized in a different way. She saw Marat as a purveyor of evil, actively bringing the destruction of her country. So she decided to pack her bags and leave Normandy to head to Paris to take Marat out. Charlotte Corday decided to spin Bastille Day in Paris, which if you haven't done it, it's fabulous. You can get drunk by the Eiffel Tower, and anyway, this is not why she was there. She was going there to kill somebody. Here I am, drunk on a boat in Bastille Day. It was fun. She actually had planned to kill Marat on Bastille Day for some sweet, sweet, full circle justice, I suppose. I don't know, it's very poetic. However, the festivities got canceled. But this tiny little thing here, Soul Sisters fist bump, she decided she would just get into his house by claiming to have information about some Girondin and Girondin sympathizers. Girl. Girl. On July 13th, she gained an audience with Marat, who was stuck in a bathtub. Marat was plagued by something that's believed to be dermatitis herpetiform. Listen, I didn't go to med school. He had a bad rash all the time. As such, he would spend time in therapeutic baths in a bathtub that looked like a boot. I have pictures of it, I'll show later. And he wanted info, so he let her into his bathroom. In the early 90s, I went to the Henry Ford Museum in, in Dearborn, Michigan. My mom's from there, and um, apparently I thought enough of it at the time to take a photo of Marat's bathtub. It's like I knew I would be doing this TikTok at some point. On her way to meet Marat, Charlotte buys a kitchen knife. Marat entertains her as she comes in while he's just sitting in his bathtub thinking he's gonna get a list of names names of traitors he can presumably arrest. What he didn't know is that she had a knife. And so Charlotte stabs him to death. But instead of running out of the house, she just chills there and waits to be arrested, which she is very quickly. She is taken by an angry mob to prison. She didn't fight it. She knew exactly what was gonna happen if she did this. And unfortunately, sometimes when you uh, take out a political leader, Instead of being held a heroine, you make them a martyr. After four days, she was sentenced to be guillotined. During her sham of a trial, Charlotte never once wavered. She faced it with bravery, but no one was impressed enough to save her life. While she was in the trial, she noticed someone in the court drawing her picture. After her sentence of death, she asked her warden to let him come into her cell to finish the photo. It was granted, and we have this picture now. That's Charlotte on the day she found out she was going to be executed. He described her as serene as he finished up the photo. And there is nothing that will get more people out for a spectator sport like a guillotine than a pretty woman. And she was very pretty. And this execution is the point where I think Charlotte displays some serious Gen Z energy. If you saw my post about um, decapitation earlier, then you'll know this story already. After her decapitation, one of the executioners held up her head and slapped her and it is said that Charlotte's apparently still conscious head gave him one of these. Throwing shade from the grave. The torment of Charlotte's body continued long after her head was chopped off. Because the men of the time just could not fathom that a woman would do this without the urging of a man. God, I hate it with men. <clears throat> they decided to give her a posthumous examination to make sure she had not known the love of a man. Because if she had, that meant she probably had a co-conspirator. To their shock, Charlotte was still a maid. So they just tossed her body into a grave. According to this book that I have found online about her life, her head actually ended up in the possession of Napoleon Bonaparte's family. Charlotte's father was heartbroken by her death. He had already lost his wife and another child. But years later, as he was frail and approaching death, the man who drew this photo came and gave him the finished painting. Her father was buried with it. And the rhetoric changed now. Charlotte is considered a hero.